We're back on the big show, and it's always nice to talk to an old friend and a delicious friend and a talented <laughs> friend, Misha Paris. How are you? I'm very good, darling. It's good to see you always. You're amazingly talented, and Thank you're you. still here. And all these years later, people still want to hear your music. There aren't many around like you, are there? I know. I do feel a bit like the only one, and it's not. It's very lonely where I am, because you know it's interesting when I'm in America. Um, a lot of my friends in America, it's normal for all of the people in the industry to be around for a long, very long time and still be valued. Um, in the UK, it's a little bit different. Um, people kind of die in their careers here. And uh, so I'm sort of an enigma in a way. It is interesting when you look at your path of success and who's interested in you. You've always really been taken seriously as an artist. You've never gone for the cheap shots, have you? You've never gone for the number one for the sake of it or the front cover or falling out of a bar just to get publicity. <laughs> Did you realise that that was a wise choice for longevity? I, I think that, uh, you know, what? if I was that smart, I'd be a multi-millionaire. <laughs> and I definitely don't think that's the case. It's only, it's the way I was brought up, if anything. My grandparents are ministers and, you know, I was brought up in a really strict environment and we had fun don't get me wrong but it was very strict and there's just no way I could do that there's no way I could allow myself to just disintegrate in a club or fall out of a club or I couldn't live with myself because that's just the way I am I, I I'm very like in my mind I feel that it's it, as a woman um, I love being a woman and um, I, I hate seeing women looking like that and that sounds quite sexist the way I've said it but for me it's the way I was brought up that women have to be you know together and keep their act together and look gorgeous and look great and try and be nice and all that stuff I come from the old school thing and it's interesting because we were talking before the interview about when it all seemed to go wrong was there a point when you woke up one morning and thought the business has suddenly changed absolutely I mean you know I felt you know, I came in the industry when I was in 1987. I, I was 17, signed my record deal with Ireland. Took me a year to make the record. Oh, those are the glory days. Those were the days, you know, sitting in, um, you know, Island Records and Bono walking past, Courtney Pine, Ben Hi <laughs> Mish, you're right. You know, Steve Winwood upstairs playing on the piano, you know, and, you know, uh, Jamaican food cooking in the kitchen. And that was Island Records in the old days. It was amazing, amazing place. And, you know, every single person down to the person that made tea was behind my record. And it was the most incredible feeling. It felt like a family. And I had that up until um, 89. So between 87 and 89, it was fantastic. And then the industry changed. Then Chris Blackwell sold Ireland. And basically a lot of accountants and lawyers came in and was running everything. And it just felt, for me, it felt like a death. So you're still here today. How have you compromised to still be current and have a hit album and a new single that's coming out and not fall away and give up like so many have? Well, um, I believe the truth of it really is, is that I've always done things that I really believe in. I'm really true to myself like that because number one, I'm so afraid of embarrassment and I can't, <laughs> I couldn't imagine someone saying, oh my gosh, Misha made the worst record ever. That's my biggest fear. So that's why it took me like, you know, two years to make the record because I just wanted it to be right. So um, I think if you stick to things that you truly believe in and you feel and you don't give up your artistic integrity, I think you're probably going to do good things because you're coming from the right place. But I think when it becomes sort of all about commercial and fame and celebrity, and it's all about that, then it, it kind of dies somehow. I think there's an honesty with that. There's honesty when, uh, I'm honest with myself, just because I, I know that I'm gonna make music that's quality, I'm aware that it probably is not always gonna be a big seller. Hmm. I've always known that. I've always known that I'm probably not going to be like a Whitney or Anita Baker or something like that. But um, but I know that if I just keep doing what I love in time, people will get to understand what I am, which is just someone who's true about what they're doing. I love real songs. I love singing real music. And I don't want to compromise that. It's interesting when I listen to your voice live because it's so unique 
and just different and beautiful. Thank a you. place that was made for you seems to me to be Vegas. And you might go, well, how dare you insult her in that way? But really now, it is the place for great entertainers. Yes. And that's a place where business is business. You drag them in, you'll stay there and you'll be paid very well. There are people on $100 million contracts it's for 10 insane, years. It's insane, isn't it? Is that somewhere yeah. you could go? Because an audience would then be coming to you every night and word spreads quickly, doesn't it? In a place Absolutely. Like I mean, I, I didn't take it as an insult at all. I, I think the Vegas thing is brilliant. Do you know, I'm not too fond of the town. I mean, I've been a few times and I'm it's just, it kind of reminds me of Legoland. It's kind of, you know, it's, I don't know what it is. It, you know, it's a funny one, but um, no, um, I think the most incredible thing is, is, is being able to play in a place for months on end and just have everyone come to see you there and you don't have to move. And, you know, I've got children, so it's like, you know, well, I, it's a perfect scenario, but I, I prefer, in my mind, I sort of said Vegas was 10 years from now. This was in my mind mm. 10 years from now. But hey, if it came sooner, I wouldn't say no. Because we're catching you in the middle of a run at Ronnie Scott's at the moment. Yeah. I just want to talk about how you're feeling. We're talking to you in between a show last night and one tonight. <laughs> um, the, the nervous energy that you have leading up to it, the thing I hate about doing late shows in a day is that your whole day is preoccupied thinking about it. Have you learned to deal with that now? And are you just able to relax until the point you walk into the theatre or the showroom? You know what's really strange? It's funny you say that because... Um, you know, I hadn't made a record for 10 years. And when I went in the studio to make the album, I was absolutely terrified. Like, I can't tell you. I was like, oh, good. I was really, like, <laughs> scared. And then the first year of, you know, going back on the road again was like that. I, I, I started to get this tightness in my throat. Like, I couldn't sing. Every time I went to go and sing, I felt like I couldn't sing. And don't laugh, but I actually went to see a hypnotherapist. And here, you know, he put me under and he was telling me that my throat was becoming tight because it was scared of what it was about to do mm. so it was a subconscious thing i was doing and then after that it was fine and you know since that session i had with him i don't have any fear about performing i'm just like i do it now and it's fine because there is a lot of pressure i mean when your name's on the tin if you yeah. don't perform yeah. it's going to be a bad gig i, I remember frank sinatra said that the, his biggest fear was people would turn up and said he didn't sound like frank sinatra Wow. Because there's a lot of pressure, isn't there, to be you. We want to hear that big belting voice. And if you're on an off day, it ain't yeah. going to be there. Yeah, it, it, it's the worst. It's the worst thing. It has happened to me where the voice is cracked in the middle of the song and it's gone. You have those ones. I mean, mm. you know, to be, you know, I'm British, so it's the worst. Living here as a vocalist is the worst. The weather is terrible on your voice. I mean, I take more cold and flu medicine than you've had hot dinners when I'm about to do a show because you have to, because everything's swollen, because you've always got a cold here mm. or there's always something in the weather, the damp, it's just wrong. Don't mention but, the swine flu. I know. Do you know, it's just all of that, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's not the best place to have, you know, to be a singer mm. in the UK, but you're right. You know, with what Frank Sinatra said, it's, it's your biggest fear, but I don't know what's happened. It's like suddenly in the last year and a half of, of this album, doing this album has, has changed me somehow like I suddenly feel like you know it's always been there it's what I do I absolutely love it and I know that it's my life and I'm not afraid of it anymore and actually you know what if the voice cracks in the middle of a song my audience I can say to them you know I'm sorry I tried to do it and it's not the end of the world but I think when you're younger it's, the, it's like, you know, you just want to die. But when you get older, you kind of learn how to handle your failures, I think. You've got this new single out, which we talked about actually a year ago, and yeah. it is just the most incredible single that I've played forever yes. in the last year. I love it. The words are so beautiful. It's so beautifully written. Born Again. Um, why now again for Born Again? Yeah, well, you know what happened is that uh, we put the record out in May, I think, and we put out Baby Come Back Now. This was always for me, this is why I call the album Born Again. This for me was always the single. But when they wanted to put the record out in the summer, I didn't think that this song was right for the summer. And then it was the Christmas rush and everything else. So I said, you know, I think it'd be good for us to release it now because we're still sort of in the winter time. Well, you know, it feels like winter still, even though we're coming up to spring now, but you know, hello. <laughs> and um, I just thought, I don't want to lose this song because I think this song is really the Sorry, I didn't That's turn right, my baby. phone off on a That's okay. It's cool. Nice ring. Yeah. <laughs> You're like a twat on the train when it rings. Oh, yeah. it's Stay. funny. Um, Sorry. The this was for me the this is the reason why I called the album Born Again because for me this was the song that was the 
the song that really described me so much and what I've been through. And I felt that this song needed to have a release. So um, that's why we're putting it out now. All right. It never got officially released. Let's listen to it, but listen to the lyrics. I mean, really listen. Because you know when songs come on the radio, so often you just let it go over your head, don't you? You think, that's a nice tune. Listen to these lyrics, and if you're not crying by the end, I'll be amazed. Put it, just make sure that's working. All right. <laughs> Wish I wrote it. We're back with Misha Paris on your favourite local radio station. It's Alex Belfield talking to a, a goddess of singing because that voice is just so beautiful. I love it. I can't describe how much I love it. And that song, um, I don't know why it destroys me so much. It touches a lot of your life. It, was it really that bad at times? It was really terrible. It was pretty bad. I mean, the worst part, I mean, you know, first it was the bankruptcy. Then it was, you know, my eight year relationship. Um, just didn't you know it didn't work out and it, but it was horrific the way it ended and you know I was pregnant and it was all of that going on at the same time um it was a really painful time but you know I just can't believe when I look back how I got through that I just sometimes I think my god how did I, how did I get through that and it's really just the help of sister mom mates you know my kids just you know come on People say you've got to go through things like that to become a better person, but I think it's better not to, isn't it? No, really? no, I mean, no, no. <laughs> Actually, I'll be honest with you, you know, it kind of, for me, it was a snowball effect. First it was the brother, the my brother got killed, and then it was the, my relationship, and then it was like in threes. Mm. It came like that. Um, and I do agree with that. I think that when you've been through a lot of pain, you do have more empathy for other people, and you just realise that, you know what? We don't know how long we got here. We've just got to do the best we can while we're here. But but can't we listen to somebody like you and just learn from that instead of having to go through our tell? Because it, it's uh... but that's what makes it more touching to you because you can relate to that time when it happened yeah. to you. You see, mm. so and that's what's beautiful about music. I think is that when you talk about music from a place of real experience, you're really going to affect the people. I think. And when you talk about somebody like your brother. Mm. At this point, have you come to terms with what happened and how you are now and you can view him in a different light and you put aside the tragedy and just think of the person? Because that takes a, a long while, doesn't it? It does take a really long time. I mean, it, you know, it, it was 2001, it happened. And the only way I can say to you is what happens when you lose someone tragically is that you just learn to cope with it. It never, ever goes away but you learn how to handle it every day a little bit different and you just get on with it, but you, they're still there in your head. And what I feel about Jason now is more about, you know, the fact that, you know, before he went, it was so weird because he called me three days before and he said, you know, Mish, you just have to get back to music again. You've got to make music again. And that was the last time I spoke to him, mm. Do you know? And it's like, I felt like, that's my phone. Oh, God, sorry oh good, it's that. not just me. Oh, God, oh <laughs> as well. I'm going to put it on silent That's three. Oh, sorry about that. Just felt this... It's like... <laughs> he had said to me, like, I think it was three days before that he was coming over to eat because, you know, I like to cook and stuff. And so I hadn't seen him for ages, like months. And um, he said, you've got to get back to music again, Misha. And when I come over for dinner, we're going to talk about it because I really just, I've been thinking, like, you know, you need to get back to the music. I never saw him again. But it was very... You know, so you say, what do you take from that? And it's always those words when mm. he said that you need to get back to music. Because at that point, I was doing Radio 2 for quite a long time. And I was really happy just doing Radio 2. It was wonderful. I loved it. I just didn't, you know, no one wanted to sign me at record companies. So I just thought, let's do this. This is fun. Mm. You know, and so, you're very good at it. I said that to you last time. Your programs were, were very insightful, and again, it's that inner knowledge that gives it just a different perspective from somebody just coming in off the street and talking about the music. Um, and then, relationship-wise, everything okay now? Yeah, it's good now. Life is good. Life is great now. Well, I'm glad because you, yeah. you don't want too much depression, do you? I mean, you can have it for let's let's have a little bit of it to write these great records, but then <laughs> then, then let's smile a bit. There's a, there's always a silver lining, I think, um, with everyone. I think that if you hold on long enough you'll get that silver lining but my goodness sometimes you have to go in the trenches huh? mm, mm. it's like my goodness and as is and let's talk about show business now and you yeah how do you think you are viewed within the industry do you try and be part of it or do you like being a little aloof and just doing your own thing well it's not something i do on purpose i think naturally i mean when you meet me and you know me really well i'm very sociable but i'm incredibly private that's the joke i mean i'm you know 
I don't really do the industry thing. I'm only there when I have to be there to mm. do the job that I'm doing. But I don't do it on purpose. I do it because uh, uh, for me, it's a job. I go to do that job and then I go home to my life. Mm. I don't have the both, you know, the both things at the same time. It's weird. To me, that there must be a separation because if, if I'm always there, then I won't know how to have a life. And I think it's really important to have your life outside of that because you won't have one. Because you know. we're talking about this again bef before the interview that the line now is so blurred. People want to know everything, yeah. and that seems to feed fame, which then fills theatres. So that compromise has changed in, in the business in the last few years, hasn't it? Yeah, well, it has because look, the thing is, I come from a time, you know, 20 years ago when I came in the industry, you know, there was always mystery with the artists, and, and, and it was nice to wonder. I wonder what goes on when he goes home or she goes home now it's you know you besides people's ovaries um, and intestines <laughs> you know everything that's going on i find that really scary because for me do you know i've done you know i've done the odd reality thing you know touched on it a few times but do you know it's so even the ones i've done like strictly come dancing and stuff like that even that it was not even as intrusive as some of them but i have to tell you it put me off of doing it again i will never go near anything like that because it's I can't actually physically handle it. I really? can't handle people knowing that much about me. Is it the fact that when you do that, that then allows me to ask questions that ordinarily I wouldn't? Because there is an agreement, isn't there? When I'm talking to you as a reality star, I then feel I have the right as a journalist or an interviewer to ask it's you anything. It's too intrusive. Yeah. It's just too intrusive. And you feel, <laughs> you know, especially if you're coming from my time, you know, where it just wasn't done. It feels like it's just alien to me. I can't understand how you want to know so much about me. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, why? Do you know? So for me, it's, it's, it's very much, I love talking about what I do with the music and the TV and the things and the book or whatever. But when it comes to the personal thing, I'm still a bit like, you know, mm. I have a problem with it. I'll tell you, oh yeah, I'm with, I'm with such and such and he's great and that's great. Finish. I can't go deeper than that. It just feels mm. weird. I, I always laugh and see a huge irony when the likes of Katie Price gets upset that people want to photograph her <laughs> when she's not in the mood. That's, my... That's not the deal, is it? No. The deal is if you open yourself up yeah. literally to everything, yeah. they then have the right to follow you forever. Yeah. I think you, you have more of a right to say no if you don't go down that path, which is the, the way you've chosen, isn't it? Well, you know what's funny? It, it is what I've chosen, but I didn't know that I did choose it. You right. know what I mean? It would just It's just the way that I am. And the funny thing was, is like you're talking about fans and stuff and I get people coming up to me not like Katie Katie has an avalanche I mean I'm definitely not that famous but you know I get people coming up to me in, in a shop or a restaurant and you know they're so nice to me mm. I can't tell you I've, I don't think I've ever had a fan that has made me feel oh my god get them away from me do you know never but you see, that's the price she has to pay as well, if you pardon the pun. Her price is that people do hate her. Yeah, but and I you even see it on those documentaries. I get people coming up to me and they go, you know, Alex, they'll go, Misha, I just want to say I really love your music mm. or I really love that What Not To Wear show or I love that. And I go, thank you so much and God bless, take care, sign something and go. I never get that kind of maddening thing. I think it's an integrity thing, isn't it, though? Because people know who you are and what mm. you do and you stick to it. But I think you don't, you know what it is as well. The media know when you're courting them. Right. And I've always been very careful not to court the media because it's not, you, you just don't do that because it's danger. Hmm. It's danger because when they decide to say, we don't like you anymore, <laughs> you're toast. Yeah. So my thing is, is that you only see me in the media when I've got something to promote, talk about or push and that's it. Good. Right. Let's talk about today. Ronnie Scott's <laughs> tonight. Looking forward to it? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Last night was insane. We had the most amazing night. I mean, it was ridiculous. Um, I don't know what actually happened. It just, I know this sounds really weird, Alex, but when you're a performer, sometimes you get this place that you get to when you sing that you just lose almost consciousness. You kind of go off on this mad one. Mm. It's weird. To, I can't explain it, but you're just not really there. You're gone. And that's what happened last night. And it just worked. Just lost the bill. I just, I left the building and I lost myself completely in the music. It was gone. So how do you live up to that tonight then? That's what I'm worried about. <laughs> and I'm thinking about, I've got two more nights. What am I going to do now? All right. Well, we wish you luck with that. I'm really looking forward. To it. I'm going to come and see you tonight because. Um, oh, well done. So you better do a good show. Don't let me down, no will you? No pressure. I mean, I've spent four hours on a train to do this. No pressure. Uh, good luck with everything. You're you're Thanks. so talented, and this record is just beautiful. Thank Born you. again, the words and everything. Another track off this new album that you'd like us to play to end with. Oh, do you know what? Hold on. It's a good song. Yeah.
Uh, the album is is terrific and beautifully produced. If there's any song generally tonight that you could sing, your favourite song ever that you know you're going to enjoy, what would it be? Uh, it would probably be a gospel song. It would be. Uh, I used to sing a song at church called um, He's That Kind of Friend, and that song is is probably the one. You're not going to ask me to sing it now, are you? Well, I mean, I'd like you to say, if, if you wouldn't mind. I mean, oh, I don't okay. want you to I'll slap sing, me for asking. Right, I'll ask you. you know. I'll sing a little tiny bit. No one knows it, though. Okay, I'll sing a little bit. Um, I'll sing, oh, what can I sing? Okay. If you ever need a friend that sticks closer than any brother I recommend Jesus, Jesus, because he's that kind of friend. <laughs> I don't know about Born Again, you were born to do it. I love you, Misha Paris. Thanks for coming on the programme. <laughs> Thank you. I used to sing that at church when I was a little.